So our next presenter is Reese Feist. He will be talking about diplopia in a child. So that was a lot of corny, and I'm sure everybody's kind of bored now. So we'll <laughs> go to neuro-ophthalmology and get everybody welcome back up. So this was a case that I saw um, back when I was on PEDS service. So I was called to the ER to evaluate a seven-year-old boy with a complaint of double vision. So about 10 days prior to his presentation, he developed mild fever, bilateral leg pain. Um, they didn't really do anything at that point. On the 17th, so like four days later, his mom noticed that his right eye was kind of wandering inwards, mainly at bedtime. And then around that time, he started developing symptomatic double vision when he was watching TV. On the 23rd, um, he started having difficulty kind of walking around, going into walls, and that prompted a visit to the ED. Um, He's got a past medical history of gross and fine motor developmental delay, speech delay, essential tremor, memory issues, ADHD, and then obstructive sleep apnea, which has apparently resolved on his last uh, sleep study. Um, he's had tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, no past ocular history. He had two siblings with uh, amblyopia and then an aunt with some type of congenital blindness, and then he takes Intuna for his ADHD. Um, so when I saw him down in the ED that day, his vision was 20-20 and near in both eyes. I wasn't able to get a pressure on him, um, but his visual fields were fully confrontation. He had uh, minus one and AB duction in the right eye, um, and I felt like also, I didn't put this in here, but maybe minus a half and uh, AB duction in the left eye as well. Didn't have any afferent pupillary defect, no anisocoria. He had full color plates and red desaturation. Um, and for his balance, I, you know, I didn't take my prisms down to the ER, but um, it felt like he was about roughly 30 uh, diopters of right esotropia. Um, the remainder of his eye exam was you know, totally normal. He had normal anterior segment, normal posterior segment, so kind of pertinent things with the abduction deficits. No, no evidence of uh, disc swelling. His margins were totally crisp. Um, given his neurologic history, that he was already a patient of neurology, they also came down to evaluate the kid. Um, they called him a cranial nerve 6 palsy, felt that the remainder of his cranial nerves were intact. He was noted to have full strength throughout, and then good reflexes, normal sensation, no ataxia, normal tone, no tremor or rest. So while he was still in the ED, they got a CBC, um, which was essentially normal, just a little bit of lymphocytosis, slightly high eosinophils, but his CMP was normal and his TSH was normal. Um, neurologists like to get ACE more than even the uveitis people, and that was also normal. Uh, really the only thing, he had kind of a slightly elevated ANA titer. Um, it, they weren't able to get the lumbar puncture initially, but uh, the next day uh, they had a op normal opening pressure uh, under one white cell, normal uh, protein. The, it was a slightly traumatic tap, so a few red cells. Um, he wasn't able to tolerate sedation on the initial day of the emergency visit, so all they could do was a quick CT brain, which was read as normal. The next day they were able to get an MRI, um, but it was slightly motion degraded, and so the, the neuroradiology hedge was uh, subtle neuritis, maybe underappreciated, but no, no real evidence of anything on the, CT, on the MRI, so it was essentially normal as well. So he got admitted, um, and then somehow, I, I didn't see him again during the course of the hospitalization, but at some point he was also given a diagnosis of a cranial nerve 4 palsy, which I'm not sure where that came from. Um, I didn't see any evidence of that um, on my initial exam. But they started him on an oral prednisone taper for kind of a presumed uh, like post-viral uh, cranial neuropathy. He was discharged home two days later and then had follow-up with neuro-ophthalmology on the 26th. So um, this was you know slightly reassuring, the top part at least. His strabismus exam was kind of roughly what I, what I saw down in the ER. So uh, about 30 diopters of right esotropia and primary gaze. Dr. Warner felt like his exams were consistent with bilateral uh, cranial nerve 6 palsies. But really the, the only difference here, um, his vision was still excellent, normal color vision, all that stuff, but um, she, when she checked his reflexes, he was found to be uh, hypoareflexic, kind of in his lower extremities, which was a change from um, his actual neuro neurology admission. Um, so anybody kind of have an idea for the next step of what you'd like to do? Who's on is... You can pick on people. <laughs> Nico, you're on neuro-ophthalmology <laughs> now, so... Um, 
So you got a lumbar puncture, you got some basic labs and an A's. Uh, you got a slightly elevated ANA. &A. Anything you're going to do? I do. Besides some of the Dr. Warner. So. <laughs> I mean, I'm concerned for the uh, the hyporeflexia. So I'm, I don't know. Maybe EMD studies at this point is maybe one 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 thing to look at. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a great idea. So what she actually ended up doing was kind of along that same same vein of thinking. So you're thinking of you know something kind of in that Gabbard spectrum and. So she actually uh, ordered uh, anti-ganglioside antibodies, and then these came back positive. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure who this was scanned into his chart, but I can imagine her writing this. Um, <laughs> so, but so Guillain-Barré syndrome is an inflammatory polyneuropathy characterized by acute onset and rapid progression, symmetric muscle weakness. Um, so the overall majority of the cases occur one to two weeks after some type of respiratory or GI infection. Um, there's a ton of different subsets of this, uh, this uh, syndrome. So most cases in North America and Europe are uh, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyridicul polyridicular neuropathy, AIDP. And then there's more axonal forms. Um, these are kind of distinguished on paper, but can be really difficult to to distinguish clinically. Just you know, in terms of the, the symptoms that patients have, the electrodiagnostic testing can be less than helpful sometimes. But on pathology, they you know they say the AIDP is characterized by inflammation of the and destruction of the myelin sheath over, over the nerves, and then MAN is more actual direct damage to the uh, neuron cell membrane. So this was a table from one of the papers just kind of talking about some of these other, other subsets. So, you know, in addition to kind of these three main ones, there's some other even more rare forms. So Miller-Fisher's is one that we're aware of. Acute uh, pandas autonomia is, uh, kind of affects the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Um, acute sensory ataxic neuropathy and then pharyngeal cervical brachial weakness. And then there's just a whole spectrum of you can even get kind of a brainstem encephalopathy. Um, that often coexists with uh, kind of encephalopathic features often coexist with some of these other ones. Um, so the clinical features, I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we're all familiar with it. So it's kind of typically thought of as an ascending paralysis. Um, the characteristic thing on lumbar puncture is a uh, cytoalbuminological dissociation. So you get a normal cell count, but you have high uh, protein on the CSF. Um, nerve conduction studies are typically become abnormal after two weeks. Um, you can do MRI, which can show some enhancement of the nerve roots. Um, and then about 50% of patients with just classic Guillain-Barre syndrome can have uh, positive anti-ganglioside antibodies. So Miller-Fisher variants, the one that we're, we kind of encounter more here, um, is characterized by the trite of ophthalmoparesis, ataxia, and areflexia. You can have just pupillary abnormalities, so um, anisocoria, sluggish reactivity, light near dissociation, which can indicate an internal ophthalmoparesis. Um, this is classically associated with any GQ1B antibody, and it's reported to be uh, present in about 80 to 90 percent of patients with Miller-Fisher variant. Um, over, a, over a period of weeks. Um, in the first, one paper I found in the first week um, of study after presenting with symptoms, about 48% of the patients had positive antibodies, uh, but no CSF. Um, and so this still wasn't super high sensitivity for the, for the antibody test, but it does, does become uh, positive uh, towards the end of the disease. So by about three weeks, most of the patients had, um, had positive GQ1B antibodies. Um, there's, like we saw on that sheet uh, a while back that some of you wrote, this is the answer on. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ganglioside antibodies that they test for and kind of classically associated with different um, subtypes of Guillain-Barre. And so this is just a table showing those. So just to finish up quickly, the patient course. So it, one month he was seen back, he had no change in his strabismus exam. He was uh, still about 30 diopters of esotropia. He was alternately patching. Um, and then uh, followed up in the, neuro the uh, pediatric neurology clinic, and um, they were weaning him off his steroids. Um, he's coming back, I think, uh, towards the end of this month, and we'll follow up with Dr. Warner again. Um, and then, you know, important to note that for most of these patients, they, 
they typically ex uh, experience a full recovery um, over a course of months. So hopefully he'll um, get back to his baseline. But he was he was um, pretty isotropic when I saw him. So that was kind of short, but. Um, Dr. Warner always skips my neuro-ophthalmology grand rounds, but this is my this is my second neuro-op grand rounds. So, um, you're all. Because she knows you're so good. <laughs> so, any questions on this? Actually, one thing I forgot to mention too, um, that I think I just skipped over. I, I found this pretty interesting. Was on the. Uh, and actually, I don't know where that went. In one study of um, about 100 patients with just isolated cranial nerve 6 palsy, so excluding tumors, excluding a high ICP, um, excluding diabetes, they found 25% of the patients had uh, any GQ1B positivity when they tested them. So, for, you know, 25% of patients might kind of fall into this category because these any ganglioside antibodies aren't typically associated with, you know, just to just normal people, it's kind of a, a, a pathologic association. So, but it's kind of something that that made me wonder. You know, how many of these things have I missed? Just with some, a lot of just that we call just a normal six nerve palsy. But so, Dr. Olson. So, a fascinating case, and and uh, uh, a couple of things that were important is that a lot of us have just thought of classical Guillain Barre, these super sick people on ventilators, mm -hmm. and that we've got all these variants, and some of them can be pretty subtle. Uh, and so uh, all of us need to be aware that, that, that like, just like you said, I mean, the, the thought that a lot of these, oh, it's a six, it'll get better on its own, it gets better. A lot of these could indeed be a variant. The second one is, is that due to Zika virus, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot more Guillain-Barre. Yeah. And Guillain-Barre is getting to be quite common down in Brazil in areas where there's a heavy endemic Zika. I mean, this is one of the responses that adults have at a much higher frequency. So we've got to all be a bit more sensitive to the fact that this is what we're dealing with and that uh, it is immensely more common. And, you know, the biggest mistake neurology did is they should have taken this to neuro ophthalmology right from the start. So I, I think our team probably picked it up. I'm glad to hear, though, <laughs> even the muscle weakness tends, tends to get better with the, I mean, with yeah. the uh, beyond beret. You, you okay. just can follow it. Do, do they ever? need to have muscle surgery I and mean, it's essentially at this point the feeling is is that almost 100 percent given time we're going to recover some like anything else some don't i think that you have to follow them long enough and that will vary depending on whether they are in the amblyogenic range or not true sure. you get a young child or we don't wait a year an adult you can wait a long time and lee and i were just talking you can also temporize with fresnel prism sunglasses or something to try to reestablish binocularity decreased risk of amblyopia loss of binocularity in a child. This child at age seven is right on that cusp right. where you may or may not have issues so that I wouldn't hesitate if it is just staying the same and not getting better over you know, three or four months to go ahead and, and do some eye muscle surgery, um, get the eyes through. Mm -hmm. But great you're right, case. most of them get better. And that is a great case. Good reason was the, uh, I, I think the consult king, I think he set records for a number of consults done, certainly time spent doing consults. Um, he was just agonized over consults, did a wonderful job, and this was another one of those cases. I mean, it was uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard work and, and much appreciated. Thank you. Great case, thank you.